lesson. And certainly our prayer is that in all that we do, that it will be pleasing, acceptable in the sight of our God, that we can worship in spirit and in truth and say indeed with God's approval that it has been good for us to have been here. We're going to talk about the way of salvation. The reading this morning says there will be a way. Christianity is referred to as a way, not always by people who approved of it. When Paul came to Rome, they said, we know that this way is everywhere spoken against. And so it was one that many people did not appreciate, but nevertheless, it was the way. And as we uh, look at the passage here from Isaiah chapter 35, it is a prophetic statement way back 700 years before the coming of Christ, before the establishment of the church. It was one that spoke of the way, and uh, we need to uh, recognize that it is the way that leads to life after this world is over. We, um, we are going to look at this world. The Bible says here down the Left-hand corner down there, with regard to the world, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. And begins to tell us with regard to those things of temptation that all of this is going to pass away. We look forward to that wonderful time when we shall be in that glory land, that wonderful place called heaven. Uh, Paul said with regard to it, he says, I know that there is a crown of righteousness laid up for me, not for me only, but for all of them that love his appearing. We need to be people that love and appreciate everything that God has done for us. We need to be people who have obeyed the Lord's will in order that we may receive that crown of life. Paul said, not just for him, but for all who love his appearing. And surely, as we love to come and worship, and as we love to hear God's word preached and taught and study together, we're people that love what God would have us to love and appreciate that. The place we want to avoid, on the other hand, is this terrible place of destruction. We need to recognize that the way that we're going to be able to do that is to be in the way, spoken of in Isaiah 35 and verse 8, that wonderful way. Jesus said in John 14 and verse 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by or except through me. So Jesus is the way. We need to be in Christ Jesus, which is a term that really speaks with regard to the Lord's church. We need to be in him by being people who have obeyed the gospel so that we are added to that way, added to his uh, spiritual body, the ecclesia, the church of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But now as we think about this, I want to suggest to you that Jesus talks about a narrow way and about a broad way. It is in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13 and 14 where you find Jesus saying, Enter ye by the narrow gate, for uh, the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. We certainly don't want to go in that way that leads to destruction. For uh, those who enter in are many, and the gate is narrow, and the way is difficult or hard uh, that leads to life. But we need to be in that narrow way that is one that sometimes is difficult. But the easy way, the broad way, we want to avoid that. We want to do what God would have us to do. And so I want to suggest to you as we talk about being in Christ, and we'll consider this circle here the body of Christ or the church of the Lord. Ephesians 1 and verse 3 we find saying with regard to it, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. Notice this passage. Paul is saying all spiritual blessings are where? All spiritual blessings are in Christ Jesus. In the body of Christ, which is the church of the Lord, it is the kingdom of God. We have the privilege of being in Christ Jesus. If we walk that narrow way that leads to life, we can be in Christ Jesus. Let's look at some other things with regard to the blessings. It says all spiritual blessings. Now, there are a lot of physical blessings that are enjoyed in the world, not just by Christians, but by everybody. The Bible teaches that 
the rain falls upon the good and the bad. The sun shines upon the just and upon the unjust. These are physical blessings that come to everybody. But on the other hand, when it comes to the spiritual blessings, while there are some spiritual blessings that other people who are not Christians can enjoy, the Bible says all, A-L-L, -L, all spiritual blessings are in Christ Jesus. And let's think with regard to just what that may entail. There are a number of things we need to see in that connection. One of those spiritual blessings is redemption. The passage in Ephesians 1, 3 says all spiritual blessings. Read on down to verse 7, and we find it saying here, in whom we have redemption. In whom? In Christ Jesus is what it's saying. In whom we have redemption, he says, through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. What do we have? We have redemption. We have, this passage says, we have not only redemption, but we have all spiritual blessings, and our sins are forgiven according to the riches, the riches, the marvelous riches of God's grace. The Bible teaches that we have rich blessings on every hand, Though he were poor, the scripture says, yet for our sakes, rather he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, that we through his poverty might be rich. We can enjoy the riches of these blessings. And one of the wonderful things is that in Christ Jesus, we enjoy the blessing of redemption. And in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7, it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, all things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. One is born again. He is a new member, a babe in Christ. You remember that Nicodemus came to Jesus by night, and as he talked with Nicodemus, we find uh, Jesus saying to him that he had to be born again. He had to be born again if he was going to see the kingdom of heaven. When one is born anew, he is a new life, and this passage is saying with regard to that, that one is a new creature in Christ Jesus. Behold, all things, he says, behold, all things are become new. It is a wonderful relationship as a Christian that we can enjoy. Redemption, that to be a new part of a new creation, and then moving on, it speaks with regard to our remission of sins. In Acts 26 and verse 28, rather Matthew 26, 28, as the Lord was instituting the Lord's Supper, he says with regard to the cup that he took, the fruit of the vine, he said, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for remission of sins. Those who are Christians enjoy the remission of sins, redemption, they're new creatures, they have that, and they have the privilege of assembling around the Lord's table on the Lord's day to, pay, to partake of the loaf and of the, uh, and of the fruit of the vine. The Lord says, if we do not do this, there's no life in us. We enjoy the privilege of being able to commune with our Lord and Savior and to enjoy the fellowship one of another in, in this particular act of worship. And then it speaks with regard to sanctification. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 12 says, Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Jesus was taken outside the walls of the city of Jerusalem. He was taken outside the gate. It wasn't lawful to crucify a person inside the walls of the city of Jerusalem. So he was taken there and he suffered outside the gate. And this passage says that we might be sanctified, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood. He suffered outside the, outside the gate. Sanctification, and not that only, justification. He says in Romans 5 and verse 9, Much more being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved. We shall be saved from wrath through him. So what have we done? We have been redeemed if we're in Christ. We have been redeemed. We are a new creation. Old things are passed away. We have the remission of our sins, sanctification, justification, 
and so many other wonderful blessings. As we come together to worship God, David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go up into the house of the Lord. But the Old Testament economy was so much less than what the New Testament church is with all of its blessings as we come together on the Lord's Day and as we enjoy the fellowship of Christians, not just upon the Lord's Day, but as we're Christians seven days a week, 24 hours a day, with the blessings of prayer and the blessings that God's providence uh, reaching down to us and making all things work together for good to them that love God. What a wonderful relationship all of this is. And so we need to ask ourselves just how, how is it that we can get into this kind of relationship? We look forward to heaven. We look forward to that crown on life's other side. Uh, I was assigned a topic to speak at the, uh, at the Memorial Day lecture, at the lectureship, Labor Day lectureship over at the at 6th Street this coming year, and I'm looking forward to that. I was asked to speak with regard to the song that was written by Tillard S. Tetley. Brother Tetley lived to be 102 years old, wrote 130 songs. He was a preacher of the gospel and did a great work in the Lord's work. He wrote these tremendous songs, and one of those songs he wrote back in about 1923, Heaven Holds All to Me. Beautiful, beautiful song. And really, as we think with regard to that crown and the blessings and all of the things, he says in the song, Heaven holds all to me. Earth with its treasure, earth holds no treasures, but perish with using, however precious they be. Yet there's a country to which I'm going, heaven holds all to me. Out on the hills of that wonderful company, country, happy, contented, and free, loved ones are waiting and watching my coming. Heaven holds all to me. A reunion is a wonderful thing. It's great to get the family together, but year by year there are those who pass on from us, and we look forward to that occasion when there will be that reunion on life's other side. He goes ahead in verse 3, says, Why should I long for the world with its sorrows? When in that home or the sea, millions are singing the wonderful story Heaven holds all to me. The story of this song is interesting. Uh, Brother Tetley had uh, begun learning to write music and read music and all of that. He attended his first uh, singing school at age nine. By the time he was 18, he was teaching singing schools. His first singing school was taught at the time when he was 18 or 19 years of age. And they didn't have little short singing schools like we do a few days. They had them two weeks long at that time, a week or two weeks. This one was two weeks long. And they would, they would come together for six hours every day. And you wonder how they did that. Well, most of them were farmers then. They laid by the crop, and then every year they'd have a singing school, and they'd invite somebody. No wonder they had wonderful singing. They learned to sing, to read the music, have four-part harmony, and we, uh, we somehow are slipping away from that wonderful heritage. But I think of Brother Tetley as I think of this wonderful song, Heaven Holds All to Me. Uh, the things of this life are transient. They pass from us. We look forward to that, and Christ has made a way for us to be able to enjoy the blessings that are part of all of this. We should look forward to it as we continue the Christian life. So the question is, how do we get into Christ? If we're going to participate in these wonderful blessings, how do we get into Christ? We're not just those that are listed, but all spiritual blessings are. It is important for us to hear. That's why we preach the gospel of Christ. The Bible says with regard to this, as Moses spoke with regard to the coming of Christ, he says in Acts chapter 3 and verse 22, Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear, or him shall ye hearken in all things whatsoever he shall say to you. That statement is made back in the book of Deuteronomy. It's made again here in Acts, the third chapter. Is Peter is preaching with regard to the gospel and 
and saying that him shall you hear. We are to hear what Jesus said, what the Lord commands us to do. In, Acts, in Luke chapter 8 and verse 18 it says, take heed, take heed how you hear. We're also told to take heed what we hear. It's important for us to hear, but we're to hear the truth. We are to hear those things that the Lord would have us to know and believe. It's important not only for us to hear, but also for us to believe. We're going to put this man up here and let him walk up the steps of obedience to the gospel. One is to hear. Notice he has his Bible in his hand here. The Bible certainly is to be our guidebook from earth to heaven. We're told to buy the truth and sell it not. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. It's the guide from this life to heaven. So we are to hear it, but not only to hear it, but the Bible teaches that we are to believe. In John 3, 16, Jesus said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We're told in many, many places that we are to believe. The statement in John 8 and verse 24 says, If you believe, if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. They could not go where he would go. They would die in their sins, and the Lord makes it very plain. It's important to hear. It's important for a person to believe. But not only that, as we look uh, on further in this, it is to change our life. The truth of the matter is hearing and believing changes our thinking. But more than that, we are to change our lifestyle, and repentance causes the person to change his lifestyle, change his conduct. In Luke 13, 3, it says, except you repent. This is what Jesus said to them. Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Interestingly, three, two verses later than that, in verse 5, he said the same thing. Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. It's easy to know what we ought to do. Repentance is a difficult command sometimes for people to obey. It involves a change of life, not just a change of thinking, but rather a real change of life. But not only are we to hear, believe, repent, but the Bible teaches that we're to be willing to confess. This brings everything out into the open. The disciples really had concluded on the inside of their heart that Jesus was the Son of God, but it was there in Caesarea Philippi that Jesus asked them, but whom say ye that I am? And Peter spoke out boldly, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Uh, he said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, flesh and blood are not revealed unto thee, my Father which is in heaven. But there's always a blessing in confessing our faith in Christ. Some people don't have the courage to do it. There were many who believed on him, the scripture says, but they would not confess him lest they be cast out of the synagogue. The Bible teaches the importance. He says, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before the Father which is in heaven, Matthew 10 and verse 32. If you deny me, I'll deny you before the Father which is in heaven. So we are to confess. And listen to this passage in Romans 10, chapter 9 and 10, verse 9 and 10. That if thou wilt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Yes, we are to hear and to believe. That changes the thinking of a person. Repentance changes the life of the individual. Confession puts everything out in the open. And then as we think further than that, let's still ask the question, how does one get into Christ Jesus. How does he get into the body of Christ? Notice the passage we read just a moment ago where it says that if we confess with the mouth of the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God will raise him of the dead, he says, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. And with the mouth confession is made unto. There are the steps that we take as we came to this building this morning, the steps that one takes unto doesn't necessarily put a person into the building, but there is that final step that a person must make as he goes into the building. 
And I would suggest to you as we ask the question, how do we get into the building? How do we get into the body of Christ, as it were, this, into this wonderful relationship? The Bible teaches that we are baptized into Christ Jesus. He told them to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Mark 16, 16. He told them, he said, All authority hath been given to me, go therefore and preach the gospel. They were to go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. They did that. Peter, as he preached that first gospel sermon, when they were cut to the heart and they realized that they had sinned and crucified the Lord of glory, and they said, Men and brethren, what must we do? We find Peter saying in Acts 2.38, he said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Baptism is the act that puts us into Christ. We are buried with him by baptism. We rise to walk in newness of life. He said to those Roman Christians, he said, God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine delivered unto you, being made free from sin. This is the thing that washes away, washes away our sin, puts us into Christ, into that kind of relationship with him where we have redemption, we are new creatures, we have the remission of sins and sanctification, justification, and all of those things. But not only that, that's not the end of it, that's just the beginning. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 9, we have what are referred to as the qualities, the Christian qualities that we are to add to our life. We find him saying in this particular passage, it says, besides this giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. We are to add these Christian qualities. He says, if these things be in you and abound, they shall make you that you shall neither be bare and run fruitful in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We will have fruit, we will bear fruit, and he's telling us in doing this we grow and develop as the Lord would have us to. There on the other hand, as we look at the qualities, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love, seven qualities that should be added to our life as we grow and as we develop. Peter says, but grow in the grace and knowledge of Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If anyone really grew, Peter was a man who grew. You look back at, at the weakness that he exhibited early in his discipleship and how the Lord chastened him and criticized him for some of the things he did and for lack of faith. But later he becomes a, a stalwart, a great a strength far as the kingdom is concerned. But we need to be careful. We need to recognize that once saved, not always saved. The statement is made with regard to uh, this, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth, Romans 10 and verse 12, let him take heed lest he fall. One can become unfaithful. That's the danger that we face. And 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, Wherefore, uh, he says, let, Therefore let us uh, we're to always abound in the work of the Lord. We're to continue to be faithful. Revelation 2 and verse 10 says, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. So what do we need to do? We need to get in the way, in that way that leads to heaven. We need to get into Christ. We do that by following the scriptures. He says, If you continue in my word, that's what we need to do to hear and to believe and repent and to confess our faith in Jesus Christ and to be baptized into him and then to be faithful in his service and to add these qualities to our lives to be the kind of people that the Lord would have us to be. We need to ask ourselves today, now where are we? Are we in the narrow way? Are we with the crowd the, going the broad way? The broad way leads to destruction. But we need to be people that are steadfast, unmovable, as this statement says in 1 Corinthians 15, 58. That's what we need to be. 
We need to be unmovable, always abounding. That's going forward, making progress, continuing to grow, serve. And the Bible says, be not weary in well-doing. Galatians 6 and verse 9. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Don't faint. Don't fall by the wayside. Don't ever give up. Don't be discouraged. But to continue so that you can be as Paul who said, I have fought a good fight. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of life which the judge, the righteous judge, shall give to me in that day. So we need to ask ourselves today, where do we stand? And if we're not in a right relationship with God, there'd be no better time than today to confess your faith in Jesus as Lord. Jesus said to Peter, Blessed art thou. You will be blessed too. But not only to confess your faith in Christ, turning from your sins and repentance and all of that, be buried with your Lord in baptism to rise, to walk a new life in Him. And if you've done all of that and somewhere along the way you've stumbled and you are unfaithful today on that road that leads out of the kingdom on down into eternal destruction, don't continue in that kind of way. If you're not one that has been saved or in a safe condition, you can do something about it today. You can make things right. We need to ask ourselves, is this the day? Will today be the day that I decide to go to heaven? One has to make a decision. There is a tendency for people to put off their decision. They don't realize that putting off the decision is making the decision. When one decides not to do it now and put it off, he's saying no to the Lord. There's no better day, no better time, no better occasion. If you need to come to Christ today, our prayer is that you will, that you'll do it now as together we stand and as we sing.